Hello, and welcome to MG Fours and Double Your Business. Our mission is to build million dollar businesses so that we can have financial freedom, time for our families, and make an impact in our communities. Let's kick it off with some big wins. Baker, lead the way, please. Yeah, big wins are I landed a contractor and a realtor to uh, schedule some painting work. And I've been uh, every day trying to contact at least five prospects uh, that I would like to work with. Just basically going off how good their Google reviews are and because they're not everyone is our client. So I've had a, a big win of nailing down a couple now and uh, sold a couple of jobs. So trying to get going, get ready for sure. Training. Okay, fantastic. Right on. Way to go. Thank you. Alex, big wins. My big win today would be that I'm on track for first and second quarters of uh, my sales goals. Being part of the estimating program and the the actual goal workshop was great. The uh, DYB system has helped me so much to achieve that. So that's my huge wins right now. We're looking at first and second quarter and we've already hit our sales goals. So. Awesome. awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. So for those watching or listening on the podcast, when we host the uh, estimating class or the uh, goal workshop again, scale of one to 10, how likely would you be to recommend it? 10. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Asa, big wins. Oh man, we're, can you hear me? Okay. We're yes, wrapping sir. up our, uh second project of the business. It was a pretty big 3000 square foot full house repaint. The, uh, the painters, gave me a ton of grief and were fighting me at every turn and mm. chewing me out over all kinds of stuff that I didn't think really made sense. But we handled it. We got it fixed up and the clients are really happy, hoping to get some referrals and get some more huge projects like that. Okay. Right on. In the meantime, we'll be interviewing for new painters, right? Be out there getting the hiring campaign going and, and working on our hiring for character skills as well right on but way to get it done and create raving fans that's awesome way to lead asa strange big wins buddy yeah big win this year's off to a great start last year was my first january started in august of 2022 and i think the whole month i did like maybe 12 to thirteen thousand in sales and the first two weeks of this year i've done forty thousand. so Quite a jump last year, <laughs> yes, so sir. big win, good start to the year. Excited to carry the momentum into this year and have one of my biggest years yet. Awesome. So glad to hear that. Well done. Way to grow. Thank you. Paul? Yo, big wins. Uh, yeah, we're working. And <laughs> uh, a couple of estimates I did in December that I was counting on didn't come through, so I took on a funky job that we got through, yeah. doing some okay. sheet rock and I, you know what, in the, in all the years I've ever painted, mm -hmm. I never had to pass a, an inspection, not by paint. You know, I mean, I've never done work where I need to pass an inspection and I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, okay, we'll put in the insulation. So I had to pass an insulation inspection. Then I had to pass a drywall screw inspection, which I learned a lot. And, and thanks to the Lord and much prayer, we made it through. <laughs> yeah, we literally did. And then one of the jobs that I had bid in December called me yesterday and said, can we start? And I said, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> Big win. Yeah, yeah, it's a good thing. A lot of good things going on. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. And Alex, welcome back to Mastermind. So glad to see you back. Big wins. Thank you so much, Steve. And yeah, you said my big win of this week or last week. It was just re-engaging again with the way me system and coaching. So that's my most biggest win that I can yes, count. Yes, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Fantastic. All right, Ryan. Uh, go ahead. It looks like you're muted. Go ahead and mute there and then share. Ooh, good morning, guys. Big win. Closed out that big problem customer and Thank God, got some favor. Was able to get half the money and two five star reviews out of it. She's happy. I'm happy. And uh, yeah, uh, work's going good and I'm super grateful. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Ryan. All right. The one thing that we can brainstorm for you, such that might make everything else easier and or unnecessary. Alex, would you leave? All right. I was just wondering for you guys who've gone from one to one million and in between there, what kind of personal changes did you have to make to go from one to 250,000, from 250,000 to 500,000 and from 500,000 to 1 million uh, in sales revenues? So I'll, I'll lead here and then love to hear everybody else's thoughts. I would say there's 
the mind shifts are zero to 250 to a quarter, and then from a quarter to about 750, and then from 750 to 125. And in each mind shift is to get to 250 is to bring on some help, right? You have to first bring on some help and understand that it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. And that nobody's ever, if, if we're coming into this as a painter, like some of us in here, like Ace says, I'm not a painter. I just started a painting business on tech background. But for those of us who came up as a technician, we're perfectionists and, and we know how to get, you know, how to lay it down perfectly as if it was sprayed using an old brush, exaggerating a little bit. So it's shedding the Superman cape and understanding that not everybody is going to do it as perfect as we are. And once we understand that we just need to get them to 80% and what really matters is the customer's experience. So shifting our obsession from a perfect paint job to a great customer experience is how we get to a quarter. Now, taking that great customer experience and getting to 750 really is shedding the whole Superman suit and getting four guys so you can get out of the field and focus full-time on networking marketing. You have to get at least, it usually depends on the economics. Every business is different. Okay, but if you if you're driving you know, whatever Escalades and, and and living in a great big house, it might take you six or eight people before you can step out of the field. But if you live in a modest lifestyle, you can step out. Sometimes three guys, depending on how modest of a lifestyle you're living. But you want to get to at least four on average. You step out of the field, and then you can focus on networking and marketing full time, and that's going to shoot you up to 750 easy. Then at the 750 mark, you bring in uh, an admin, and that'll help get you to. 1.2. And at that point, we're talking about bringing another salesperson who also manages their own projects. If they're employees, if you're running subs, then you're going to need to bring in a project manager to help manage subs because subs can be tough, as Asa testified at the beginning of the uh, show here. Any other thoughts for awesome. Alex? Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything? Cool. Well, what, what one of the things I'm sure you're going to get to, which I thought of in myself, is you're going to start to need you're going to need to have your your standard operating procedures down and all that stuff going. When you once you get to a certain point, when you had have, have the help, you're going to have to start defining yourself and start defining. I'm saying so that because in my mind, it, it, you're bringing on people and you don't have everything defined, you're going to create chaos within your company. Like Asa had to fight with his painters, fight with your painters because things weren't defined with the painters, or what we're doing, how we're doing it. You know what I mean? And, and I don't know about all the employment laws and if you can tell people how to do it or whatever. Like I said, I don't know if they got the employment law police coming after you with that. Or But you can set the standards. Set standards, so, yeah. So, but that would be one thing that I've noticed myself that as I move forward getting more employees, I, you've got to set you've got to set that you've got the, the, the standard operating procedures have to be started and, and defined and, and, and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. to, to Paul's point, you even with subs, you can set standards. You might not be able to legally dictate the procedure, but you can set standards and hold them to those standards. When it comes to your SOPs, which ones do I doc, uh, document? You write down the ones that you're delegating first. That's the order priority or the ones that you're delegating. Maybe it's job flow, exterior setup, interior setup, pressure washing, and then how uh, to paint a room, how to paint a wall, how we clean up a job, how we wrap up a job, how we collect a video testimonial, delegate that one too, right? Mm -hmm. Which ones do you do? The ones that you're going to delegate. And then as you bring awesome. in an admin, you start documenting all your admin procedures as you're delegating those. Yeah, good point, Perfect. Paul. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Let's go back to Baker. You're next. You can mute it. Sorry, I couldn't hear it. Sorry. Uh, for suggestions on growing, is that word? Oh, your one, so your one thing, sorry, what's the one thing we could brainstorm for you? What problem do you have or question do you have? Sorry. Um, I don't have anything today. Okay. Sorry. Right. If, <laughs> if something comes up, uh, just let us okay. know. We'll circle back to you at the end. Perfect. Okay? I'm just soaking it in so that, yeah, I don't have anything issue today. Cool. Right on. Thanks. Right, Paul, you're welcome. Paul, you're up. Oh, I hate this question. You know that because uh, the one thing is always everything. But... I, I just, I need to bring on, uh, because it's a consistent, I thought about this question before we got our meeting going, because I hate it. Uh, <laughs> it always seems like, what's the one thing? It's, it's everything. But one thing on my end that is a constant is the clerical part, the administration, and how you were talking about once you get to a certain level, you want to bring on some admin. And as I was listening to you talk to Alex about that, I was thinking, I might need to get the admin going on a part-time basis prior to that to help me get to there. I need to delegate that. 
I had a thought this week. I'm going to visit my daughter in, in Kansas City. And she's living there, got a couple grandchildren there. And uh, there's no, I, I don't have any of my kids don't even live in my city anymore. To me, I go, I wonder what it'd be like, wow, if I moved to another area like Steve and when I go visit. <laughs> and if I went to work for another painting company, how would I, what would I do? I, I don't know if you want me to paint, but then I thought I could be a, I could be a, what could I be? I don't know what I'm even good at <laughs> estimating. I'm not very good at running numbers. I'm not very good at doing a lot of stuff. I'm a pretty good painter, but I ain't a painter for somebody else. So quick, quick comment. You're a master uh, artisan. I don't think faux is a quality enough for you. You're a master artisan, hands down. But is your question, what's the next step for bringing on an admin or should I pack it up and go work for somebody? You're one of my kids and I'll see about doing some masterful work for them. Yeah. No, they, I, I, because if I do masterful work and hang out with my kids, pretty soon my kids will be having me take care of me. And that's not my goal. Yeah. My goal so here's what we do. Bring on an admin. Independently of me, which is, yeah. I did think of this week, I'm leaving tomorrow morning and mm -hmm. guys will be working. And it will be running. I'm like, I'll have my phone, but you know what to do. And it was, it's all good. I do have that aspect. It's set up in that way. The, just the numbers end and all the clerical part does is still keeping me up at night or waking me up in the middle of the night sometimes. And, and I, I need to alleviate that stress and get an admin to help me because I'm just back when I was going to school and they were all telling us that computers are the future. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to need no computer, all right? So I was wrong on that. So I just, I need to delegate that because I am not doing good at it. And that's okay. So here are, sorry, here are a few first steps for you. One is you want to start with something that April branded Life of a Lead. And Life of a Lead, and we'll say phone call. It could be you can book me from your fancy new UIB website or phone call. And I would start with a phone call and just write down how to answer the phone. A lot of people laugh at this, but hire somebody who's never answered the phone before and bring them in. And you'll say, oh, okay, we do need to document this procedure. We come from the curse of knowledge. Everybody yep. knows how to answer the phone. No. So you want to answer the phone. Hey, it's a great day at Dib Doll Painting. So-and-so speaking. How can I help you? Right? So you want to set the tone. So write down the questions they ask and the questions you want them to ask, in which a lot of them are very similar to the booking questions you have on your website. And then... What's next? And then write that procedure down. Then what's next? It's usually book the estimate. How do you book the estimate? Yeah, no, I have gone through that. And I was thinking, what was it, two meetings ago or a meeting ago? I was talking about that. Yeah. Think, ask yourself, what does your company do? Like when someone can do that, when someone calls you, what's what happens? Like what you're talking about, the life of a lead. How do you do that and define yourself? That's why I was saying you start to need to define yourself on these mm -hmm. things. It was a it was an interesting conversation I had with myself about if I were to go to work for another big company that's running in a way I'd like to burn my company, what position would I take? And I'm like, I don't know if I'm good at anything. I'd be the old guy who could teach you stuff. Yeah, he's <laughs> really yep. good at it. But so every, here's here's next what you want to do. Then go to Indeed and mm -hmm. search your market for what is your market paying for a part time admin. What do their headlines say, right? Now you want to do some copywriting research. Which headlines do you think are sticking out or grabbing them? And you want to write a headline that's better and you want to offer a competitive wage. It would um, it would be worth it to me. It's definitely to have a competent person to yeah. do that. Um, right. Yeah, because if you're building, throw out some random, I forget off the top of my head, but so I have that video on YouTube, how to figure out your hourly sell rate. And so if, and what you want to do is plan for what you're growing towards. So if you're building, say, a million dollar business, anybody quick on math, what's 1 million divided by 2,000? 500? Okay, somebody's not yet. We'll say it's $500 an hour, which means half that if you're building half a million dollar company, $250 an hour. So your hourly responsibility value to your business is either 500 if you're going for a million or it's $250 an hour if you're going for half a million. Mm. should you really be doing X, Y, or Z? Ideally, you want to do what that's ring, Wayne Gretzky told us is he skates to where the puck is going. So you want to skate to where the puck is going. And to do that, you delegate everything you can and you do only what you can do, which is network and sell. It's network, sell, training. 
And so you want to do everything you can to get there. And so when it comes to answering the phone, we can delegate that one, which is another mindset of letting go of the phone. And to get to that 750 mark, also, it sets that healthy barrier there for you. So your phone's not pinging all day. It shouldn't be pinging all day. You should be meeting with customers and not being interrupted and just being able to be with them, be present with them, listen to go through the whole sales process, but not be interrupted, essentially. So to have that boundary of being able to delegate the phone number. And so a lot of times, guys will take their cell phone number and turn that into the business number and get themselves a brand new, shiny, private cell phone number. I want to be like Walter White and have burners. Call me on my burner. <laughs> All right. All right. That's awesome. You good for now, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was right. great. Hey, my pleasure. Strange rep, buddy. Yeah, I was. I think one of the things I'd like to talk about, I think I go through this probably once a quarter at least, <laughs> but I think just having motivation sometimes can be hard for me. And, it, and it's not motivation to do work. Like I'm fine with just going to work and doing it and got to do what I got to do type thing. Yeah. But sometimes I'm like, man, I just, I'm not enjoying it. I am not, I'd rather just be at home hanging out with my kids and my family. And I'm like, just, Oh, I got to go do another estimate. Oh my gosh. I just don't want to get to it. And I got to go do this job site check-in and just everything just feels like I got to pull myself to go do it. And it's not always like that, but I would say at least once a quarter, it's just brutal to get yeah. through some days. Anyways, I think just, yeah, just some sort of motivation or how you get some of those sluggish moments. So we've been there. Usually there's uh, something else that coincides with these calm seasons. So a lot of times it's the winter, the winter seasons get a yeah. lot of guys down. I'm originally from Michigan and we had what was called sad seasonal affective disorder. And so we'd buy these lights and we'd sit in front of these lights to increase the endorphins and hopefully they make us feel good. I still don't know if they really work or not, but <laughs> uh, so is, is there anything else going on or are there, you know, what are some other commonalities during these seasons, right? Are you still sleeping as well? A lot of it comes down to health, physical. So are, yeah. are you sleeping well? Are you exercising? And are you eating well? So if all three of those are off, we're going to, we're not going to have motivation because our health is off. And a lot of times we don't realize it. Now, I don't know if this is the case for you, but I'm just trying to check all the boxes here as we go down the list. Yeah, honestly, we, it's been, even that has been better. I've been working mm -hmm. out more consistently since the beginning of the year. That's why it's confusing. My wife cooks yeah. food. We're not really eating any sugar. Or I'm not really mm -hmm. staying off of having a drink at night for a little while as well I'm getting oh yeah that, that'll mess up your sleep yeah but i'm getting a pretty good amount of sleep but you need that deep rest do you use sleep trackers i used to okay. i don't do it quite as much anymore so try I, one I with that because i you, got try one when you have I a drink hours and i still woke up really tired so yeah so what happens is the alcohol and the sugar spikes your heart rate and you don't get the deep sleep that you need in the first half of the night which is critical for energy the next day i haven't really been as I was saying, is I've, I've been cutting off of, of drinking for a little, having a nightly drink for a little mm -hmm. while. But yeah, I wonder if it's the cold weather. That definitely, it's been pretty cold. Here and so here are a couple of others. Side. Here are a couple of others, and then we'll open it up. I just want to hit the base of the bases. One is if the marriage isn't rocking, if our wife isn't supporting us, our morale goes down. Just one little slighter criticism, and we're like, I'm even writing this out. Now, we don't have to go into that. But I'll jump, I'm going to jump to the next one. Just something to consider and for anybody else listening. But the next one is a lot of times we get into a slump when either business is way down or business is too good and we're comfortable. Or we hit new highs and we're cash flowing. We're like, huh. we take a break and relax. And like the fire is not there, right? The urgency isn't there yeah. because we're doing well. Sometimes that's... That, that might be it, Steve. Because my, my marriage is fine. My wife is super supportive and very encouraging, and she's fantastic. Great helper. But honestly, that could be part of it. I feel like I just I hit a good roll for a little while. And I think looking at after I after you hit a lot of your goals and you get to this point where you're like, what's next? And you're like, yeah. I just keep going. <laughs> it just never stops. It just keeps going and going. <laughs> that could be yeah. part of it where it just feels like oh, this never ending cycle of, of leads and estimates and jobs. And it just keeps going. This is it. <laughs> so I have some more ideas for you. I'll tell you what, let's hang out after, uh, after the meeting and we'll dive a little deeper and see. Okay. okay. All right. Any other thoughts 
were strange while we're here. We have two Joshes for everybody listening. That's why we're going by last names. Too. Your thoughts, Steve, uh, the seasonal affected disorder. Uh, I, I consider hibernation. I think humans are supposed to hibernate in the fall. The light goes away. And so I set my mindset to know that I'm going to be more tired in the fall. I start getting more sleep and I start designing my activities to know which ones I will be able to get done, which ones are going to affect me. Um, I know that I get super overwhelmed sometimes and that sometimes causes me to have a, a lack of motivation. But one of the biggest things that I always do to keep motivated and I guess there's a difference between motivation and drive, but to keep both motivation and drive, I keep my why at top of the mind. So mm -hmm. I always think about what my why is, and that always refuels me to keep going. I like that. Right on. Strange. Just a quick thought. I've only, I've dealt with that a little bit since pretty young company, but one of the things I keep coming back to is that there's all these ups and downs in any job and what you're doing, you're building for yourself, what you're doing has unlimited upside versus when you're unmotivated and down working a W-2 job. It doesn't matter how hard you work, how many hours you put in, is the outcome is going to be more or less the same. You're building something that you can hand off to your kids that you can sell one day. But so there's all kinds of upside and the ups and downs are just part of everything. But at least you're in a better place for the ups and downs, if that makes sense, being your own business owner. Yeah. Right. Quick, it reminds me of a book called Peaks and Valleys, a short book, easy read. I think it's by Ken Blanchard, if I recall correctly, Peaks and Valleys. Really cool book. It's great to read when you're in a valley, and it's especially great to read when you're at a peak, if you want to stay at a peak. Josh, I think you were going to chime in. Or Ryan, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would just say, and I do the same thing, and it's like some things that help me is, okay, grat it's not cliche, but gratitude list helps, reminding myself, like actually doing a top 10, top 20 gratitude list, I'm sober, wife, children, business, guys, car, just everything. And it's like really meditating on each one, be like, wow, not everybody has these. I didn't have all of this before, now I do. And, and then just reminding yourself that it is temporary. And then feelings aren't facts. Feelings, God created us, we have feelings, but just it's like a mindset thing and a perspective. And the peaks and valleys, you know, it's like highs and lows. And you have that perspective, uh, that contrast, you know, when you're in the valley, it's, oh man, okay, God's with me and get it out. Boom. And then you're on the, the, you know, on the peaks and it's like, you look back and you have that feeling of like before and after. And it's like just this new passion, new vigor. And just knowing that, like, I think Asa said, it's man, I am an entrepreneur. I have a business. I have, I could go sign a $50,000 job. And it's like, I, I can employ people. I can provide services to people. Yeah. Just taking a step back and being like, wait, everything is great. All right. Back in it. And then. The great reminder of the gratitude list. Uh, that was something else. So great. Uh, try to write 20. Brian Trace says, always go to 20. You usually get to eight, nine, 10, pretty easy. And then 12, each stretch and 15 is work. And then 20 is really hard, uh, especially when you come up with new ideas or whatever. But for a gratitude list, um, it's really not that hard because we take so many things for granted. We're like, oh, clean socks, clean underclothes. That's not a lot. Not everybody has that. Yeah, the gratitude list before you go to bed, like right before you go to bed and write it down, pen and paper. Makes a difference. It sets your, it puts your mindset in the right perspective to dwell on while you're sleeping and you wake up feeling better. Asa, Asa is excited about clean socks. Yes, sir. It's a hard thing. It's good. It's nice. It's nice to know that someone else has those issues i have those issues a lot and i wonder what it is that blocks my vision why i don't have motivation i can't I have a mental block and then thinking about you just sold forty thousand dollars worth of business in january which is crazy insane and you've got this mental block of motivation still you know what is that i get that myself whether you're having a success you know, sometimes, like you said, there's relationship issues that are going to affect it, money issues that will affect it, um, different issues. But there's still that mental block that is just yeah. even if you're giving yourself the Stuart Smalley effect every day, giving yourself, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough. And gosh, darn it, people like me. <laughs> All that, uh, uh, if you're doing that, it, it's still. And so one thing maybe you can take away from this is that 
I have that too. And I go through it a lot. I'm getting older and I love that I have motivation as an older guy. I have ambition. I love it. You know what I mean? Sometimes though, it's just blocked. It's a mental block. I can't see. I cannot see beyond. And and I don't know what clicks it on. I'm you know, it clicks it on and off. I, if I can figure that out, I think that's a secret sauce, really. I mean, but for now, there's a bunch of stuff that you can try to get through it and, and appease your mind. Till it, but you will break through. It'll come through. Something will happen. You maybe you need to figure out what your means to your end is. Sound like you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to go on another estimate, do a billion. Da, da, da. Sounds like there's a monotony of where am I going with all this? So maybe you need to figure that out and then bust a move because you seem pretty ambitious and smart. Yes, sir. Appreciate yeah. that, Paul. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Asa, you're up. All right. So this is going to be pretty basic for everybody else, but I think the thing I'm running into is I'm working on my job standards, right? I get job standards over to people, but I, I have things in there like two coats of paint is standard. Like we sand, we sand walls before we get the paint on, like scuff sanding. And I get a lot of, I get pushback from a good amount of painters. I'm like, okay, am I crazy? Are my standards off here? Are these the painters you don't want to work for? I try to take these standards from like the PCA guidelines, Irwin's product specifications, stuff like that. But I still feel, am I taking the crazy pills here to have a high bar for quality? Cause like, I want to charge towards the top end of the market and the work's got to match the yeah. price, right? Cause otherwise you're overcharging under delivering. And I don't, I'm not about that. So when I started my first business back in Michigan, I was 19 and this drove me crazy. I hired highly skilled painters and worked for anybody and everybody, builders, commercial, residential, you name it. Everybody called, we did it and I hired for skill and about drove me nuts and certainly drank too much to deal with all that stress. I don't drink anymore. It's been like 10 years now. I just finally gave it up. But one thing that took my thick head a long time to realize is that I was hiring for skill. I should have been hiring for character. So the question I have is, are you using my 11 interview questions when you interview these guys? I haven't seen those. I'm using... Okay. Yeah, I'm telling people character, talk about core values, stuff like that. And they're nodding and saying, oh, yeah, uh-huh. A little bit. So, yeah. So instead, go into the cafe, okay, and they're, they're, it's in the hiring course, but also have it directly in the toolbox for you. So just go into toolbox and look for 11 interview questions. They're right there. And if you're placing a hiring ad, go into the hiring course and check out my hiring ad. The hiring ad is written, copywritten to attract good people. And then the 11 interview questions, but they don't realize it a lot of the times, but they're going to reveal their character to you as you ask them these questions. And those will be red flags to you of whether or not this is going to be a smart hire. Also, something else to keep in mind is that Chick-fil-A, their model, you go in there and they're just like, they got all these teenagers who are just some of the most well-behaved in the world. My goodness, where where these teenagers come from? And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to sit down with some of uh, Chick-fil-A's leadership. And one of the big takeaways I had is that they have to interview 50 people before they find one. So for us, a lot of times we're in a pinch. We're like, I just got to hire. I need somebody. I need some painters. And we hire too fast. And it's understandable because we've got schedules to, to keep up. But if we switch our mindset and we set up hiring campaigns so that we're collecting more, way more uh, leads than we need for hiring and then go through them, pre-qualify really hard. And when we interview them, use the 11 interview questions and their character review themselves. Then the other thing is make sure they give you references and call and confirm every reference. When we skipped a step, it was usually the reference step and it bit us every time. I'd have to say to that character is super important. Like Steve's saying, I noticed that it's really easy to be a good painter because most guys can't even finish step one completely. They start skipping and shortcutting all, all over the place. And, and especially the skilled guys, there's something with painters. When you're a painter and you tell another painter how to do something, all of a sudden it's no, that's not how we do it. That's not how it's done. For some reason, painters always know better than other painters. So I agree. Hiring by character, someone that's going to be trainable or 
want to learn what your standards are, not argue with you. You're the one paying the money. They shouldn't be telling you how it's done. You're, you're hiring them for a certain quality, for a certain standard, and you shouldn't be paying someone who's not willing to deliver that for sure. Just to qualify Alex's comment, his painters not only show up on time, but they travel with him up into the mountains and camp out in tents on certain projects. Talk about character. That's pretty awesome. So they can all start. Thoughts? I'm sorry, Paul. They can all start a campfire. So off them wandering moose. You don't ask, hey, how, how's your painting skills? How's your camping skills? <laughs> <laughs> the more, more you define your character, the more quality of guys you will have. So that's all I In fact, about Alex that. has an awesome hiring ad. And I think Paul, if I recall, Alex correctly influenced it and you put in you like to camp and you like to hunt elk and and whatnot to help to attract the right guys uh, yeah. along with all the character i want to add something steve mm -hmm. uh, it's so important to hire for character and find the right people but i also think it's just as important to work on ourselves to be a good person too because and where i'm going with this is i see a guy like alex or everybody in this group and i can put i can envision in my head as a younger person wanting to work for each person in this group and other mastermind groups I've been in, those are typically the quality of people in those are trying to get better. And so I, I think when you are working on being a good person ourselves, take Alex, for example. Yes, he has great employees, but they also do that because they care for him and they know he's a good person they want to give. So I, I think working on ourselves is just as important as trying to find good character, who we attract. That's so good, Baker. Thank you. That reminds me of a Jim Rohn quote. Anybody remember Jim Rohn? He's passed now, but he's one of the leadership greats like Brian Tracy. Yeah. He says, don't become a millionaire for the money. Become a millionaire for the person you have to be to earn a million dollars. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. So hopefully that was helpful for you, Asa. Let's see. Who's up next? Alex. What's the one thing we could brainstorm or solve for you that make everything else easier and or unnecessary, my friend? It's just a question or curiosity last this week i just lost a job to a competitor the customer who contacted me i've been done maybe like at least like six projects and every project they're mine she just called me and do this project and it's mine but this one it's she's gonna be renting the house and the owner i think he hired his person so i'm thinking maybe he came out to the competitor and says, okay, let's see, this company is charging me uh, X number and can you beat that? So he just came down a thousand dollars. So my question is because this is the second time it happens that I don't have the opportunity to talk about numbers uh, with a customer if they have any doubt or, on, or any other price. Is there a way that to present to the potential customer I know if we said we can make this price better or something, we might attract the C customers, but is there any way or technique that I can use to mm -hmm. at least present that opportunity, that bring up that to the customer and say, I'm open to talk about it? Uh, thank you. So, yeah, really good question. This is a tough position. A uh, couple of uh, clarifying questions here just for context. So your customer that you've done work for, were all of the previous ones rentals or were, for they, were they for his... Personal home. Personal home and commercial properties. They're yeah. wealthy people. Yeah. So I think this was just a budget issue. It sounds like they like you, but on this rental, it was just, it came down to the, the cheaper price. Now being, he had a relationship with them. It is, it is unfortunate. It's not cool that he didn't circle back to you and said, Hey, could you match this? And, but I, I wouldn't encourage you to say, Hey, listen, if you get a better number, come back to me, let me know. Cause that's opening them up right away. Letting them know, Hey, I can go cheaper. You don't ever want to throw that signal out every time right away, right? Because that's going to that's gonna put you in a weak position. You want to be in a strong position. This is an unfortunate uh, scenario. Would he, So he gave it to the other guy. Was it for $1,000 less, cheaper? Yes, but just to clarify, who made the decision, it's the landlord, the person who she's going to be renting from. Who is your so, customer? The renter. Okay, so the... I'd say the biggest issue here then was that we weren't dealing directly with the homeowner. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you, in order to have leverage, to have power, to have influence, 
is you want to deal with the decision maker, the owner. If not, so many things can go wrong. And it's like, yeah. how do we get around them by doing everything we can to talk directly with the owner so that we can make that connection with them. They get a sense for us and they understand, and then we're able to communicate value versus competing on price is what we're left with there. Okay. That's, and that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah you're welcome. Sorry about uh, that went sideways for you. The next one's going to be yours. Okay. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. That one hurts. It was interior and exterior, but thanks to God, we are close all the way to, February already. So. All the way to February. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Glad to hear that. Thank you. One, one thing that might be good for you there is that your client was given the opportunity to have another painter who charged less and they will respect your work so much more and keep continuing to go with you. I used to be so afraid if I couldn't get to one of my client's jobs or anything, but it has helped me more than has ever hurt me. They get a less price or they get another painter in there and it's not even to the standards of my quality. And they never even have to question it again. They will pay more for rentals next time. So I find that's a blessing in disguise when that happens too. So that's true. Good point. Thank you. That and if a good painter leaves you, if a good painter leaves you, a lot of times that happens as well. As long as you have a strong culture and you're a great leader and a good person, they will come back later on and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Can I come back, please? This is such a great company to work for. You know. So good point, uh, Alex. Thank you for that. All right, let's circle back up to Baker. Anything come to mind for you? Sorry, guys. I, I guess I would just add to that, to what his issue was, is that is a hard one because you're in a tough spot with trying to, somebody asking to lower and it's somebody you worked for before. I would take it one of two ways. At least, I think it shows a sign that they do care about the relationship, that they did circle back and at least say, hey, this is where they're coming out. It shows that they really do want to use you, but there is a budget issue there rather than just ghosting you and not calling or anything. But I, what I've learned in the past is it takes what it takes. It costs what it costs. I've, I've definitely lowered before to get a job. And to about that three-quarter mark, you realize that you were right in the first place and your process works. And let the, let the other guys race to the bottom of the barrel and get busy with the low jobs and uh, consume with that so there's better clients for you. Mm -hmm. Right on. Thank you, Baker. Is there anything that we could uh, brainstorm for you? Oh, can't think of anything today. Just really working on, I'm kind, I'm just starting the business back up. So just working on leads and relationships right now. So that's it. Okay. Good yeah. place to start. Thank you. Ryan, you with us? All right. So we have a few uh, extra minutes. Does anybody have anything else they would like to ask or brainstorm in their mastermind before we move to takeaways? Hey, I got another. What are, what are the ways people are building value during the sales process to help differentiate them? Because it obviously a paint job's not just a paint job. There's a lot that goes into it. But mm -hmm. you know, like how do you really differentiate yourself against maybe a one man show who's able to charge less and stuff like that? Any thoughts would be appreciated. Oh yeah. Real quick, I would encourage you, have you been through my sales system in the cafe? I've got it all mapped out for you in there. No, man, I yeah. Okay, that's all right. Watching. We'll hit a couple points here, but just know there's a lot there. And I wish I could see it was just one thing, but really it's just a list of all the little things. A lot of little things add up to tremendous value over price. Okay. One of them is presenting on the spot. That's a really big one. But a lot of the young bucks are starting to catch up to that one. So it's not as valuable as it used to be. It's still valuable, but you always want to present on the spot to uh, try to drum up as many referrals as you can. That's why we're very heavy on networking. Uh, versus uh, ads or paid leads, that is incredibly difficult because of the type of customers who are uh, coming from the paid leads are usually price shoppers. So it's really tough to build value there. So that's why you want to build your referral networks and you get those flywheels going and the, the, the value just compounds over time. Right. Make sure you use the social proof and scarcity close, which I go into detail again in the videos in the cafe and the sales system. Briefly, it's where you show your video testimonials and then show your booking calendar. So you have social proof that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that your team provides the best experience. And then you show your booking calendar because everybody says they're busy, but it doesn't mean anything, but you show them your calendar. Now you have scarcity. That's powerful. And just going through that, and there's more nuances to that. Again, it's in the system for you, but I've closed jobs to where I had a check in my pocket while guy number three was waiting outside for his turn using that. And it's an honest and ethical way to use scarcity and social proof, proving your team 
with beyond a reasonable doubt provides best experience and then proving that showing that you are booked or you only have one opening in three weeks or whatever, whatever they were looking for. And you show them, look, I have one here. My job is to go around and, and I do estimates all day for nice people just like you. I really like you guys. I would love to do this project for you. Can we go ahead and get you in the calendar here, please? Okay. Smile and nod. <laughs> it's hard just... to say no to somebody smiling big and, and nodding. You really want the job. But again, go back into the cafe and then walk through that. But any other thoughts for Asa here? I had one. When I'm trying to deal with that, I a lot of paint contractors, they get a call for a paint estimate, and that's what they think they have to go sell. The product or service I'm selling is the last thing I sell. The first thing I sell is myself, who I am, why I'm different, what I do, why my company you know, sticks out from the rest of them. The second thing I do is I sell a customer experience, what they're going to get. What, what's going to happen for them, what they're going to receive and what they can expect. And then finally, I sell the service or the product. I focused on that the very littlest, which is the most, I think, misunderstood thing is that people go to paint estimates to sell paint, but that mm -hmm. everyone's there to sell paint. So we need to sell ourselves first. That's my advice. Awesome. Spot on. Spot on. Thank you. Ryan. Did you have a one thing before we uh, um, roll out with takeaways yeah, today? Scheduling. I don't know. I know mm -hmm. I've got ten, eight or ten jobs lined up right now, and I have a general okay, we're about two months out or so. But I don't know which. I don't have start dates. I don't know. I just as I as we're closing out one job, I go to the next. I call them and tell them, hey, mm -hmm. you could be over there to say the pressure wash. So I just streamline process for scheduling and any tips in regarding that topic. Okay, great question. So first. The calendar, whether guys start off using a Google calendar or uh, .com, which we recommend, it's not in stone and you haven't communicated it with anybody else. First step is it's just for you and your peace of mind. My encouragement is set it up and just start throwing jobs up on the calendar, right? Then you've got it mapped out. They can be moved. They can be adjusted. It's not in stone. But the first thing is to have a plan, right? Because uh, we mentioned Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar. Another classic, right? Said, if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's important we aim at something. And so get them and put them up on the calendar. And then next step is give yourself a day or two break in between every job because they run over. It rains where guys call in sick. Give yourself a couple day buffer between every job because it's much easier to call somebody and say, hey, we can get to you sooner than it is to have to call everybody and say, I'm sorry, we got to push you back a few days or a week or whatever mm -hmm. it might be, right? You'd want it, you, you want it, you you want to be in a position to say, hey, we can get to you sooner versus, I'm sorry, we're running late. Does that make sense? So step one is just throw yeah. it all up there on the calendar. It's not in stone. You can move it. You haven't even shared it with anybody. It's your little secret of where everybody's at. Once you're comfortable with it, you can share it, but just throw it up there first so you have an idea, so you have a plan. Then make sure, you know, you, you give yourself breaks in between every jobs for things that happen. And if nothing happens, you just call the next one and move them up. You're welcome. Any other thoughts for Ryan? I found that's easier to have someone else schedule you. I'm always worried about where I need to be. And it just causes so much stress that when I handed my schedule over to someone else and they were able to do it for me that I just had to be where they told me to be. And it took all the stress of where is this going to be? And at the same time, make sure they're the person calling the clients and scheduling as well so that they can move it around when need be. And, and like Steve said, I always give like a three to five day window in between my jobs because they're so big that I never know I'm going to finish. That way we can move people up instead of going backwards. Yes, sir. Right on. Love that. Mm -hmm. Uh, delegate it. Also, something to keep in mind is when you can show them your calendar and you can say, we can start you um, February 2nd, right here. That's powerful. Then they know and they have that confidence and they're like, wow, these guys are organized. They have a system that I feel like I can trust them. And that'll help you to close mm -hmm. jobs too. Very powerful sales tool. All right, gentlemen, mm -hmm. let's roll out with takeaways. Baker, would you lead the way? Takeaways today is you realize entrepreneurship is can be a lonely spot. You feel like you're alone. Nobody understands what you're going through. And a lot of people don't. So the mastermind group is great for that. And where I'm going with this is what Josh Strange is dealing with sometimes not wanting to go or want, not motivate. Just hearing everybody else's uh, advice, it helps me also. Uh, I wrote down the book, Peaks and Valleys. I'm going to check that out. The gratitude list is great. And then another takeaway was the 
11 interview questions. So I need to look up the hiring course and check out those references. It's probably a good idea to always have that add up on Indeed because you're always looking for quality people. It may take 50 people to go through. Don't hire out of spontaneous, you're slammed always. I've noticed that bigger companies, whether electrician or paint, they've always got a sign out there that says hiring. And I know they've got a lot of guys, but I think you're always looking for a quality person. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the mantra we use is build the list. Because you want to draw from that list rather than just throw an ad out there and hire the first warm body who can come across, promises the world and can fog in here. So Perfect. The list. Right. Awesome. Thank you, Baker. Alex? I've got two of them today. And number one is that we all get overwhelmed and uh, there'll always be an issue. So it's just something we're going to always have to keep fighting for. And the second thing is the takeaway I get from every single one of these meetings and the biggest takeaway I've got from the whole DYB system character. Awesome. Right on. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate that. Strange? Uh, yeah, very similar stuff to <clears throat> what Josh said, wrote down peaks and valleys. I'm going to go through my gratitude list. I think that's an important thing. One of the things I've noticed whenever I get in these little slumps is being prayerful and thankful about everything is a life changer. And then also just keeping my why at the top of my mind, just knowing why I'm doing this. And it's not for tomorrow's estimates for multiple years ahead and being setting up my family for, you know, to be in a good position. So mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Paul? Oh, uh, yeah. Just the same thing. It's good to have the group and to commiserate with some of these things. Got my questions answered and solidified when it comes to delegating the clerical. And I wanted to just leave you with another. I had another big win, which is pretty cool. And it's indicative of a lot of things that can happen to us in our own business. And when you're praying, and things happen with you. I should. I, I know. I talked to Steve about it. There's a thing. There's this thing coming up in my area. I do a lot of announcing. I'm out with the community. That's a big thing for you to do if you're going to be in your community, working in your community, get involved in your community. I always preach that. Whatever. It's, it's worked for me, and I didn't even realize it was going to. I was doing it. So I announced everything around town, and I thought they're they're having this Hall of Fame induction of athletes from our local college. And it's a dinner gala. And because I'm part of the athletic department, they're like, hey, they're, we're having this inductee thing. And would you want to go? And I talked to Steve about it. I said, hey, I, I think I'm going to go that just because I know there's some the big donors that donate to these people are going to be their business owners, going to be city officials there. It's going to tuxedo a van. I, I might just get tickets to go just to rub elbows. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would be a good idea just to network. And I got a call on Monday, no, Tuesday, last it was last week, this week, whatever. I got a call, athletic director from the college, and he says, "Hey, Paul, this Hall of Fame gala we're having." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Could I ask you to please MC that for us? Would you <laughs> be be, be great to have you? You could just." I was like, "Okay." Things happen in our lives like that. Here, I was going to go to something to network and hopefully further my further the business. It's happened to me several times where people will accept my bid, even though it's higher, because they know me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they really know me, but I'm out there. They see me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They hear me. Mm -hmm. I had a guy come to me last night. Oh, I knew as soon as I heard that was you. I was at a girls basketball team. Ladies and gentlemen, your Periclete spirits. So <laughs> anyway, things happen in your life. And that's one of the great things. It's hard to be an entrepreneur because you're always – you're always trying to catch curveballs that are coming at you and you're back there trying to field stuff, but you have opportunities for great things to happen too. A lot of great things. A lot of those happen. And they, and so that's a cool thing. I was thinking about, ah, maybe I'll go to this dinner. And I get asked to MC. That's cool. I'm nervous now. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, Paul. Thank you. I appreciate that. That reminds me too, just relating to you, all the networking and the remarkable presentations we did, right, from uh, singing to swimsuit body paint to Hulk Hogan. <laughs> right? I got invited to uh, act in that commercial. And then, to your point, uh, others had asked me to MC. Like, a chili cook-off was a big deal. And then, eventually, to MC the annual chamber banquet, which is a really big deal, uh, with April 9, two of our friends as well. And so, as you get seen, you get invited to more things to be seen. And it's just the flywheel. is just a compound effect. Yeah. And so, right on. Thank you. Alex, takeaways? My takeaways for today is uh, practice my gratitude list, set the scenario for my estimates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like meaning to 
ask the good questions and make sure that the um, decision maker is there. Sure. Present on the spot and show my calendar. Yes. Okay. I love it. Way to be, Alex. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And again, welcome back to Mastermind Group 4. It's great to, to have you back. And then, awesome. uh, Thank Ryan, you. Ryan, are you able to share your takeaways? Yeah. 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 Grateful to be back attending Mastermind Groups and the takeaways would be to take action and implement sooner. Do the thing that I know I need to do sooner. Just not doing that. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Are you going to tell us? All right. So that concludes Mastermind Group 4. Thank you guys. I want to encourage you to continue to dream big, hustle smarter. You've got this. Take care, everybody.